Hey everyone, welcome back to another hardware news recap, talking about some of the news in the industry for the past week. There's not a ton of it because it seems like there were just more follow-ups on launch products and things like that. That said, there's an AMD update to EFI coming out soon, another EGISA update, AGESA, and that's going to be version 1007, 1007. And uh, Ryzen APUs in HP notebooks were also sort of leaked accidentally by HP. So that's also kind of interesting. Other than that, a couple of cases, some cooler stuff and silicon lottery stuff, and that'll wrap up the news. So let's get to it. This video is brought to you by the Be Quiet Dark Base Pro 900 White Edition. The DBP 900 marks a return to full tower cases, equipped with ample hard drive support, effective noise damping foam, high performance fans, and the option to be inverted into an alternative layout. Learn more at the link in the description below. First up, just to address some questions we've gotten following all of the AMD Vega coverage, people are still asking, rightfully so, where are the Vega partner cards? Basically, it was a reference launch, and it's remained reference pretty much since launch. So the answer is this, the manufacturers we've spoken with are still waiting on AMD for sufficient supply to ship. And part of this comes down to how the channel works, where retailers, distributors, so forth, basically want some guarantee that they will have a restock date firmly. So if they get however many hundreds of units from a board partner, they want to know that in X weeks, we'll get another couple hundred units or another couple dozen units, whatever the volume may be. And uh, right now, the manufacturers we've spoken with are still basically stocking up trying to make sure they can get enough Vega parts in to build their boards, uh, build the cards, and send them out to distributors. So still waiting on that. I do not have a firm date for you. I know that it keeps getting kind of pushed back slowly. So we'll see. As for why the supply is so limited, I don't have an answer on that either. So it could be a couple of things. One of them is difficulty to manufacture. One of them is cost and potentially losing money on some of the GPUs like 56, as we showed previously. Uh, and then of course, things like other projects, for example, the Apple projects, how much of a supply is that taking versus how much supply is some of the higher end compute stuff taking, things like that. So we don't have all the answers for you. The only answer I have right now is that the reason there are no partner cards for Vega yet is because of inventory and availability and because AIB partners simply can't get enough of it from AMD to meet their supply demands that they need to meet to satisfy their other partners in the channel, distributors, retailers, all of them. So hopefully that answers that. It's not a great answer because I wish I could say like, you'll be able to buy these cards soon. We're trying to review the ASUS Strix, by the way. You've seen our PCB and VRM analysis of it. Buildzoid did that and our teardown of it and I'm still waiting on performance benchmarks. Put all the thermocouples on it today, actually. But unfortunately, until I'm cleared for by ASUS for vBIOS, I'm kind of stuck. So uh, ASUS is still trying to finalize their vBIOS and get it working with AMD's continually updating drivers. Apparently that's causing some headaches, and uh, that's why we are on hold. But once the thing actually has functional vBIOS and drivers, we'll test it. Or if it becomes retail available, then we'll test it. But until that point, there's no point because it just it's just going to be data that's representative of an unfinished product. So we're still on hold. Let's talk about this AMD update for the CPU side. So this is a Raven Ridge update and also links to Asus with Elmore, who is an overclocker and, and works with ASUS on the motherboard side of things. And on overclock.net, Elmer stated, Agisa 1007 comes with support for Raven Ridge APUs. AMD has also changed the entire BIOS base structure. So we have to do a lot of work to port everything to the new version, which may result in further bugs. The advantage is that it makes it easier to support future CPUs, parenthetically Raven Ridge or Pinnacle Ridge, the cold boot fix will be implemented as soon as we have a recent Agisa version which supports it. So basically laying the foundation for the future AMD CPUs. Raven Ridge being the APU that will theoretically include Vega, and then Pinnacle Ridge being the next immediate refresh of Ryzen. In our last bit of AMD news for this week, the Ryzen APU was also spotted in HP 
data tables for their new laptops that HP inadvertently posted on their own website, later removing those data tables. Uh, video cards captured a screenshot of this, of course, and it's the HP Envy X360 2-in-1 notebook, which has also been taken offline since, and it's including an AMD Ryzen 5 2500U quad-core. We're not clear on if it's 4 and 8 or just 4 and 4 for core and thread count. That operates at 2 gigahertz base, 3.6 gigahertz boost, and has 6 megabytes of cache. Also, interestingly, the graphics section for the laptop lists, I quote, integrated AMD Radeon Vega M graphics as the solution, marking the first semi-official appearance of an AMD Vega integration in a notebook. So this is, it's, it's looking interesting because in terms of power, you should be around low-end discrete GPU performance. And uh, it's going to come down to kind of RAM speeds and how smart these manufacturers are about the memory that they include in the notebooks because a lot of notebooks out there today, including the initial admittedly unfinalized spec table for this one, have a single stick of memory. And the place that most definitely has impact is APUs or IGPs because you end up accessing system memory to handle all of what would normally be done on video memory. And having uh, decreased bandwidth in that department is not going to be good. So hopefully the manufacturers are smart enough to, to step up the game with memory speeds so that people don't just think that the GPUs are bad because they're choking on memory bandwidth, which Vega is very bandwidth intensive and going with a single stick of slower memory is not going to work out well. Maybe AMD will put some restrictions or requirements in there. But either way, it's made an appearance. Now we're just kind of waiting for the product to show up properly. For anyone seeking Coffee Lake stock, it's still limited, just like Vega is limited. And much the way Vega launched with zero inventory, it seems Coffee Lake kind of followed that trend, which is very disappointing to see from two major product launches this year. But that's the way it goes, I guess. The retailer Silicon Lottery has listed its delitted i3 8350Ks for sale. So there's some inventory out there. The i3 CPUs have been the easiest to get. Uh, Silicon Lottery has binned them. So they've got prices ranging from $180, which is pretty close to MSRP or available price of also $180. And it ranges up to $310 for an i3 8350K. So you drop 300 bucks and get what is uh, competing in price with an R7-1700 and really not too distant from a 7700K or non-K even. But the thing is, the reason they do that is because they've got it binned. So low end 4.8 gigahertz, high end 5.2 gigahertz. So if for some reason you need a guarantee of a 5.2 gigahertz i3 CPU, you can get it for 300 bucks. Uh, that pr probably is not a good buy for a lot of our audience on the consumer building a PC side. But if for some reason you need a high-end i3 for benchmarking, for example, if you are someone who is not benchmarking like what we do, but like more competitive fire strike type benchmarking, then I guess it would make sense. That said, uh, the CPUs even at the $180 mark are delitted, and I think all of them are delitted right now. So that as we've shown, is helpful to thermals and power because you get a bit of a power leakage reduction. Not necessary on these types of CPUs, but uh, it does help when you start blasting voltage for overclocks on the K-SKUs. So those are posted, and uh, uh, Silicon Lottery is also listing expected availability of the 8700K and 8600K as October 27th. So there's still a way out there. And uh, when we spoke with retailers last, that's about what we're hearing. We're hearing roughly every other week inventory is coming in, uh, which also matches for the Z370 board shipments. So it's kind of stagger stepping out there, but it'll get there eventually. Uh, so yeah, either way, they've got the i3s up and they're one of the only places that has some level of inventory. So uh, if you want it delitted, check them out. Otherwise, NZXT had a bit of a, a leak today by accident. This was done by overclockers.co.uk, a retailer. And NZXT has an H700i case 
that is uh, officially unannounced and planned for launch at some point, but we don't know when. This was picked up by the Overclock.net forums and it was initially posted by OCUK. The H700i case looks to be a mid-tower chassis that fuses the H440 and S340 design elements with a heavy focus on cable management features rear side. Cable routing channels exist along the back side of the case with the S340's cable management bar making a return in a more stylistic fashion here. The main compartment includes a fan hub and the case supposedly includes a quote, unique cam powered smart device that digitally drives RGB lighting and fan performance. Interestingly, the listing highlights adaptive noise reduction and quote, machine learning for ideal fan settings, though we presently have no idea what that means. It looks like the case might include four Air F 120mm fans with pricing not fully known. The OCUK listing has the case at 200 GBP, but US prices, as always, can be different considering VAT and things like that. Noctua's new Chromax line offers color DLC packs for existing products. I think this is where internet comments start to get to a company. Noctua makes decent products, but part of Noctua's thing is the color. I mean, I have them right here just from another video we did. The color. Everyone pretty much knows where that color comes from. Uh, and I, I, I don't. I don't mean in a biological getting rid of waste sense. I mean Noctua's factories. So apparently that, that kind of comment's getting to them a bit because they're pushing out different color products now. They've got black fans coming out. They do already technically have some black fans, but they're doing more of them in the existing uh, NF, A14, A15, and F12 lines. And then they've also got an NF S12A PWM fan coming out. And those have the uh, Chromax corners, which are basically just these brown corners, except instead of brown, I think they have red, green, yellow, white, black, and blue, maybe one other one. And uh, those, I don't know the price on right now, but I do know that the price on the 4.5 inch cable extensions that are also colored in those same colors are $10 each, giving knock to us some killer margins. The heat sink shrouds are $30 each, and those go on top of the smaller heat sinks like this one. I think they have some for the larger ones. Uh, it covers the entire like side and top with a Chromax branding by Noctua. Uh, and then the fans are shipping Fan Plus color kit for $23 to $27. So pricing kind of like always with Noctua, it's a bit on the higher side, especially with the color changes. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard to knock them for it because this is essentially the only thing people have routinely hounded Noctua over is the color of their fans. So for them to come out and say, you know what, fine, we can make a black product like everyone else. And here's even some extra rainbow colors that you can buy as DLC add-ons. So to, to complain about that seems a little unfair, but they're trying to, they're trying to do something different. So we'll give them credit for that. Uh, Oculus News, speaking of doing something different, Oculus is trying to do something different because VR hasn't really picked up at all. It seems like the headset, the main one, the real one, has been cut to $400 now following HTC Vive cuts earlier this year. And they also have an Oculus Go for $200, not yet out. That's basically going to be an untethered, uh, actually higher resolution product. So in some ways it's technically a bit better, but remains to be seen uh, a couple things, one of which is what's in the headset. So we don't know what kind of hardware is driving it other than the screens are a bit higher resolution and it's untethered uh, and it doesn't connect to a PC. So you're obviously gonna have less in terms of graphics and computational capabilities than a computer would give you, but um, it's supposed to be mobile. So that's what they've got coming out. And that's really about uh, other than this Pimax stuff, it's it's about all we've seen from VR for the last couple of months. So uh, we've done some VR benchmarks. And in terms of interest, it was great the first run, but that kind of thing just dies instantly because the market isn't really that huge yet and doesn't seem like it's going to be this year. So there's still hope for VR to do stuff. Uh, it's just, it's going to take killer games that are really desirable and some companies like Bethesda are working on those. 
So we'll see. Maybe when these juggernauts get into the space, they might be able to pull some gamers in with them. That would really be when I would expect to see the, the make or break of VR uh, when people like Bethesda start pushing their products. As for that Pimax men mention, this was spotted by Engadget at a, uh, I believe, a China-based trade show. And they've basically got a weird 8K sort of VR headset. So on a very technical sense, it's a higher resolution than what's out there now. And that's good. That means you get rid of some of the screen door effect. Uh, it's got a wider FOV, I think more than 200. It's 200 to 210 degrees. So typically with VR, you can kind of see the black bars like right here on the edge of your peripheral vision. But uh, the reporter said that they did not notice that with this one. Uh, however, with the 8K, it's two 4K screens side by side, and it's also upscaled. So the rendered output from your machine, or at least in the case of this trade show, is lower and then upscaled. The reporter claimed that it was still a much better experience in terms of pixel density, but uh, it is not really 8K. It's just kind of getting that direction. So something to keep an eye on. That's all for this one, though. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus, as always, to help us out directly. Subscribe for more and store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.